and welcome to World Talks on TVP World here from Katowice at the European Economic Conference. I'm your host, Marie Cato. Today I am joined by CEO of ISAI, Rafał Modrzewski. Hello and thank you for joining us today. Hello, pleasure being here. So, uh, there's a lot to talk about. I'm absolutely fascinated by your story. Uh, which is fascinating in that it's a Finnish Polish company that you run uh, and you set it up at a very young age. Uh, so perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that first before we get into the nitty gritty details. Sure, I think it's, um, it's the type of European story that we hope to see more in Europe. Um, I was a student at the University of Warsaw. I was studying electrical engineering and as part of what's known as Erasmus Student Exchange Program, I have decided to uh, move over to Finland uh, for a year to study over there. Uh, that's probably one of the, the prime programs in, in Europe trying to unify different European societies and it, it has definitely worked for me. I went there, I started building small satellites, I uh, met a friend, uh, his name is Pekka, and then at the end of my year in Finland we said, look, there is so much happening around the world. People are using the technology that we now know well to start commercial companies. Why don't we do the same? And um, he said, yeah, I mean, we both said, yes, let's, let's do it. And, uh, you know, this actually happened in a, in a bar in, in Helsinki. And we've decided that that's indeed the time for us to start the company. Um, the rest followed. But the, the truth is that as we started the company, because I have only been in Finland for one year, most of my colleagues and that's whom you usually hire at the beginning, uh, we're in Poland. So we had to sort of simultaneously open offices both in Warsaw as well, in Helsing as, well as in Helsinki and sort of start this company which, which would be run from two places simultaneously. And why I'm saying that this is the type of story that we need more of is, first of all, it's a great story of how you can fund a high deep tech company coming out of the university. Second, it's a, it's a proof that it actually can be financed and it can be financed in Europe to the level that's, that's necessary. And we've raised until now over 500 million euros. So it actually is the type of financing that we used to see mainly in the Bay Area happen. And third is the type of company that shows that we have to start acting to together among the European nations to create European champions. There's been a lot of talk today over here as how the national coalitions, different politicians, how they drive their main national interests rather than try to focus on European interests. And we are trying to start having this discussion about can we really do that? Can we have national champions in everything, in every single of the 27 European countries? Or are the internal markets too small for that? And I think the overarching voice and, and, and sentiment is we can't. We've got to stop doing that. We have to start creating pan-European cross-border companies working across multiple countries because otherwise we won't have the type of scale that's necessary. Well, you're a perfect example Exactly. Of that. Absolutely. Uh, just before we sat down here, you said that you have 50 satellites at the moment. Um, tell us, how do you go from uh, a wonderful idea, a bar in Helsinki, to 50 satellites now that actually look after very serious issues because your main focus is monitoring natural disasters and conflicts? Right, so of course the, the story lasts for 10 years, mm. um, so I will have to give you a, a somewhat... An abridged a, version. A, a, definitely, a, a, an intense abridgment, if you will. Um, but, you know, it, the story starts with an idea, indeed. Then it starts with, a, with an R&D program, financed through a government. Back then it was the, the Finnish government that first financed our, our intentions. Um, then we move on to venture capital financing. Uh, then we move on to, to growth capital financing. And, uh, and, and through that time, as we, as we raise more and more money, we move from an idea which is first supported just by books, by very fundamental science, to hard first work. prototypes through a lot of hard work, through prototype 2, 15, 30th, until the first satellite which is being launched in 2018 in January. And that satellite is successful. Uh, it's only 66 kilograms back then. And then we, we just don't stop. Right? I think that's what's true about ISAI, that almost regardless of whether we've reached the goal or not, we just, we just continue moving on. So we, 
We've uh, begun the company with the intention of building a small satellite that would take radar pictures. We've done that, and yet we said, that's just the beginning of the journey. Mm -hmm. And you know what, when my um, new employees ask me today, they're like, you know, is the story of Eyesight done by now? I said, don't worry, this is just the beginning. Well, absolutely, I think there's just so much interest and growing dependence on uh, the information, the data in the broadest sense of the word data uh, coming from satellites now that I think the demand for what you can provide is just growing. Yes, indeed. It is, it is actually, when you think about it for a little bit longer, quite fascinating that we have not created such industry earlier. There are certain obvious statements that I can bring over here. You know, you can't change what you don't measure. You can't influence what you cannot see. We know all of that yet we don't really spend a lot of effort monitoring our surroundings, right? We don't really know what's happening around the planet Earth. We, don't, we know what's happening next neighborhood, maybe, but we don't have any idea what's happening in the, in the polar ice caps or in, in different countries, sometimes even not that far away from us, right? So what ISI does is we really bring to people the truth about the world. That's what we tend to say. It's about the democratization and access to information of what's happening around us. And of course, there are different ways in which you can use that information. But in its core principle, it's about knowing what's happening around you so that you can make better decisions. And that just seems so fundamentally true and obvious that I tend to wonder how come we haven't done this earlier. We are there now. Now, the important thing to understand is that this is what we call a dual-use technology. So there are probably two main areas of the economy where such information as we collect become excessively useful or extremely useful. Now one is the just regular commercial operations when we try to monitor our forests, our shipping lanes, uh, any sort of minerals that we want to want to extract and we see a lot of that. We work a lot with insurance as you mentioned focus on natural catastrophes trying to help them plan for how to tackle the natural catastrophes. Yet what turns to be more important today is the use of that technology for defense and security. The world that we live in today is probably a bit more complicated than the one 10 years ago. And there is a need to find a way to answer the questions of what is really surrounding us because we need to feel safe in order to be able to do anything else, right? And if you think about it, what ISI provides countries is an ability to see any place around the world within one hour from request. You can be there virtually instantaneously we can take an image of what's going on regardless of weather conditions or time of day. So you can take that image at night, you can take that image through clouds, and that image is available to you within the next 20 minutes and you know what's going on, right? Moreover, in the era of AI, the fact that that information is certainly not, has not been tampered with is critical, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I also wanted to ask, because I understand that uh, ISI was involved in monitoring the data during the last floods in Poland. Uh, how did you find gathering that data? Did it help with dealing with the consequences of the data? How quickly were you able to gather that information? Yeah, so uh, you're right. We're very much aware part of the, 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 the early response yeah. efforts and, and the process throughout. Um, I mean, it's, it's not something that we did just in Poland. It is a, it is a product, it is a service that we, that we provide. And honestly, today it's the world's leading service. And not many people know that. It's, it's actually quite, quite fascinating that, you know, we operate all of those satellites out of Warsaw. So usually when uh, something happens, it is the Warsaw-based operators that send the satellites over, not literally, but more or mm -hmm. less. And today we are the largest provider of flood information in Australia. We're the largest provider of flood information in Japan that actually floods really a lot. We're the largest provider of flood information in the United States and Canada. We honestly just have not yet been implemented in Poland. Hopefully that's going to change now soon. Yet we decided to do it anyway. Now, how easy was it to gather information? Honestly, for us, relatively easy because we do have the network of satellites. I can ask my guys, my team to say, look, let's now focus on observing Poland and within the first hour we are going to have an image, right? The problem with this flood is that it was actually a relatively extensive event. Yeah. So we've had to use the entire fleet in order to capture it. But again, we go back to this whole information question of like, you know, we were able to show the rescue teams which cities are flooded, which houses are flooded, not only whether they are flooded, what is the depth of water that they have been flooded to, right? 
that was critical information that allowed them to plan the rescue operation efficiently using the scarce resources that they had because those resources are always scarce. I'm honestly amazed that we have not been doing this earlier. That definitely says something coming from you. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit more about space in the in the sense perhaps that is more commonly understood by uh, a layperson, shall we say, for lack of a better word. Uh, and I just wanted to ask you what you think gets in the way of developing the space industry here in Poland, because that is something that my understanding is, uh, is something that wants to be invested in a lot more and, and moved forward. Right. I don't know, that's, that's not a straightforward question, mm. right? I think, let's go back to the beginning. The first thing that gets in the way, it's just our ability to believe that it can be done in Poland, right? I think we've started this discussion by me saying that we thought that it could be done in Europe. I can tell you, 10 years ago when we were starting, many people around us thought that we were crazy about this, right? That one could start potentially a space company in Europe and be successful. I, I actually had investors that turned us down because they said, you can't do it in Europe. And yet we've proven them wrong, right? We actually not only have done this in Europe, we've done this in Finland and in Poland, two countries which are rather not your first bet, if you were to say about potential places where a space company can start, right? So we've proven them wrong as well. So that's the first thing that we need in Poland, attitude, right? Then the second thing that we need to do. brave thing to say, I have to Thank say. you. Is the understanding of space, not even among the entrepreneurs, but within the government. Because we have to realize that for many new technologies, the government is the anchor customer, is the first customer, the sort of enabler customer that helps that business grow, right? And I don't think today we have that recognition when it comes to the Polish government. We don't know how to do that procurement efficiently. We've been just talking about this in the panel, that we're about to spend a ton of money on defense. We are not exactly extremely efficient on how to spend it, and we haven't yet set our priorities straight. And if space were to become one of those priorities, then that would be a humongous boost to what we are about to do. And honestly, I probably could go on for another few minutes, but I want to leave people with those two things. As long as we solve for the attitude and we believe in ourselves, and we solve for the first customer through public procurement, we're going to go a long way. Okay. Rafał Modrzewski, it's been a delight having you with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And that brings us to the end of World Talks on TVP World from Katowice. Thanks for joining us and stay tuned for more on TVP World.